um, for that reading. So uh, Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 is a message to the seven churches and we spoke briefly before that uh, these seven churches are spread out in seven cities that were around Asia uh, Minor, okay? And so just to deal with a, a, a bit of the introduction, you will notice that with every uh, church, it always starts with to the angel, okay? That is always the, uh, the first line, to the angel or and to the angel, uh, and then uh, Christ will then mention the name um, of, of, of that particular church, okay? And of course, uh, the, the, the Greek uh, word for an angel uh, actually literally means a messenger, okay? Uh, so so he's, he's saying to the messenger. And uh, the reason why this has always been important for, 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 for uh, 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 those who are studying the book of Revelation is that uh, these um, letters, the book of Revelation, was made into seven copies by uh, 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 John, okay? So he wrote this book in seven copies, identical copies, but each of the seven copies then went to the seven churches. And from the seven churches, okay, even though uh, 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 the seven churches then read initially themselves into uh, the first message, they then copied these letters and also passed them on to many other churches uh, that were not a, a, a part of the seven churches so that everyone um, could have it. In fact, that is how the, the disciples uh, back then made sure that anything that they taught was not manipulated. Even if a letter was sent to the church in Thessalonica or it was sent uh, to the church uh, in, in Caesarea Philippi, um, when that church received the letter, they did not keep it to themselves. They would make a copy and they would send as many copies as possible to other churches. And those churches would make copies and pass on to other churches. And those churches would make copies and pass on to other churches. So that if there is a copy that emerges, which does not look like the other copies, then they would know that someone has tried to tamper with the message. And this is why many scholars today, even those who are not Christians, those who are not uh, 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 yes, Christian scholars, but who study uh, uh, ancient literature, most of them still remain highly amazed at how the Bible uh, 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 remains uh, uh, giving the same message literally in almost every translation and language around the world, okay? Yes, because of movement from one language to another, we do see uh, differences, okay? Especially when we do what we call reverse interpretation, reverse translation, where if you take a, a, a verse, for example, uh, written originally, like in the book of Revelation, John wrote in Greek. So when you take a verse in Greek and you translate it into English, uh, and then you, 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 take the, you take the Greek one away, you put the English one only, and then you take the English one and write it back to Greek. And when you then compare the one you would have written in Greek and the original Greek one, we always find that there's probably one or two words which one would have translated differently. However, even then, the context and the content would not have changed. So this is just one of the evidences that the Holy Spirit was definitely involved in the preservation of the scriptures. So these churches did the same thing. The, in Patmos, uh, John wrote the book of Revelation, okay, in the, in the papyri, the paper, the scrolls that he was given. And he then copies into seven because they are going to seven churches but it doesn't mean that the one going to Ephesus only has an Ephesus chapter and the rest of the books and the one going to uh, Pergamos has only Pergamos no each of these books 
had a message for all the other books, okay? So when the churches were reading, they were going to be reading about themselves and the other churches um, in the message that they were given. But not only that, these churches, upon receiving their copies, as I said, they then also made copies and passed them, them forward, okay? So the first lines are always to the angel, to the angel, to the angel. Now, it has not yet again become clear whether was Jesus talking about an angel that is a custodian of that particular church in that city? Uh, in other words, saying, I write this to the angel in charge so that the angel in charge of you, of this particular community of believers may assist you to correct um, where uh, uh, I, I am finding fault, but also assist you to maintain good performance where I am pleased. That could be one part of the interpretation. The second part is, is that... Uh, because the word angel means a, 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 a messenger, it is then possible that when he says to the angel, he may have meant to the elders, the elders who would have received these letters uh, uh, from John in, in Patmos. Most likely these seven elders visited Patmos to see uh, John. And it was there that John then gave them each, okay? Um, it, is, it is, we have no verse that explicitly tells us. We, we simply use uh, archaeology, history, and what we know about the situation. It is mostly unlikely that um, John would have sent out these letters on their own because of his condition as a prisoner. It is more likely that John requested or sent probably a seven short notes to these churches requesting their elders to come and, and see him. And upon arrival at Patmos to see him, he then may have given them these particular uh, uh, scrolls which carried the messages to the seven churches and the message to the rest of the world as well. That would be um, part one. Part two of the question, why would John be the one giving this uh, message to the churches? Because when we know, for example, um, to what we know about the New Testament message, all right? We know that uh, pastoral pastoral letters were mostly written by Paul. Okay, mostly written by Paul. So th there's always been the question to ask: Why John? Why give John this pas these pastoral letters? And 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 Christ does not give the vision to um. To Paul, particularly because these are Gentile churches and, and Paul was the messenger to the Gentiles. Why John? Well, the answer is very simple. Um, when, when John left Israel, we are not too clear about the year when he left Israel. But what we do know is that he spent 30 years living among these churches in Asia Minor, and he was based in Ephesus. So John did not stay much in Israel after Jesus uh, had given them the commission to, 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 to spread the gospel. He stayed in Israel for some time, but then he left and took up the mission of uh, spreading the gospel in Asia Minor, okay? And it was there by the way, when we are talking about Asia Minor, we are talking about uh, territories like Turkey. That is what we, we, we are talking about, those regions. We are talking about uh, 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 Eastern Europe, okay? Um, particularly coming further down south towards the sea. Those were the territories that were known as um, Asia Minor. So that is where John was for 30 years. So. Paul, for example, only stayed in Ephesus for three years, okay? And he left, came back five years later, and left again. But John, John was there for a full 30-year period. And so that is why I'm saying that John was actually the pastor to these churches. And it would make sense, therefore, why Christ 
would give him this message to these churches. Although Paul was an evangelist in this region, but Paul, Peter, I mean, uh, John was the pastor in this region. Um, he died in this region, but not only that. Um, we know from the early church historian uh, Irenaeus that uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, also died in Ephesus. She lived with John all the days of her life. Remember at the cross when uh, Jesus said to, to John and Mary, a, a mother, your son, son, your mother, okay? So it, it appears that indeed both of them followed that instruction and they became mother and son to each other. So when, when John left Israel, he took Mary with him and uh, lived with her in Ephesus, with the church of Ephesus. And while he was arrested in Patmos, the church in Ephesus continued to take care of the mother of Jesus up until um, John came out or, or was released. And of course, he then spent the, the, the later years uh, of his life uh, with her and possibly by age, we, it is highly, highly, highly more likely that she then died first. I mean, it would make sense. She, she was a, at a mother's age and John himself lived quite long and died a, 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 at a fairly late age, like we said, somewhere around AD 95. Um, that is when he died and he, would, he himself would have been in his late 80s, early 90s probably um, at that time. So Mary would have uh, died quite a considerable number of years uh, uh, before then okay so he is the pastor to these churches and he is now given this pastoral message to give that is the second thing the third issue is that there's always been a discussion about how do we interpret this message to the churches is it the message specifically 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 to these churches only or is christ sending a message to these churches and to all Christians who may have the characteristics of these churches? Or is this message to denominations? Okay, in other words, yes, it is initially written to the seven churches, yes. However, in terms of its future application, could it be going to specific churches? Could there be a letter to the Catholic Church, the Methodist Church? the Adventist church, the Pentecostal movements, and so on, you know? Or is this about eras? Is this describing different uh, eras in the Christian uh, development where the, the church or the, in the development of the Christian church, some of these characteristics would be more dominant than the other? How should we read these? Okay. And of course, as I said, when we started with our reading, um, the, the, the preterists will immediately say, there's nothing for us to gain here. These are messages directly, directly to these seven churches. Anything above that does not concern us. And the idealists would say, um, let's just read uh, for spiritual growth. Uh, about the battle between good and evil and see what we can learn from it and of course uh, the futurists would say yes these letters were definitely to the seven churches but this is a book of prophecy which means there was also a, a, a message for the future church um, as well now let's look at the ones that we are able to cover in in ephesians uh, chapter 2 and see what we can learn in the applications the first one is the loveless church and that church of course is ephesus interestingly ephesus is the largest of these churches it is also in the biggest most prosperous city of them all ephesus is a bustling city a metropolitan a mega city under the roman empire uh, in those days okay in in a way uh, um, ephesus was was the london of asia minor or the johannesburg the paris the berlin the new york you name it it was the city 
of the Roman Empire in Asia Minor, okay? That is where the millionaires and the billionaires of those days uh, were found in Asia Minor. Uh, there, there was a lot of uh, worship of different uh, uh, gods uh, in Ephesus as well. And Ephesus also was a, a, a city with a patron goddess of fertility. Um, it had a massive temple dedicated to this god of fertility as well. So it was a pretty rich city and there was just quite a lot going on um, in that city, okay? And the message primarily is a message of love, all right? It is a message about love versus zeal. That is what the message is about. Christ says, look, I know you. I know how zealous you are for my things. And I know how you have uh, made sure that those who are false prophets, those who claim to be my apostles when they are not, those who are impostors in the gospel, I know how when it comes to you, Ephesus, you have tested them. They may have successfully deceived elsewhere, but when they got here, they could not make it through past you. You were as strong as, as possible in testing them. You proved them liars over and over again, and you defended the gospel. All right. Now Jesus says, however, my concern for you is this. In doing all of this, you forgot not only that I am your first love, but you lost your ability to love. In other words, you became so zealous for doing things the right way that you also lost the love that must accompany your attitude in doing things. And you forgot that you were doing things for me, who is a savior. In other words, Ephesus, uh, uh, while it was strong in defending the gospel, it ended up bordering on also being very legalistic and very cruel, no longer merciful and forgiving as the Christ whom it represents. Now, this is where then it becomes a challenge to just say these letters are written to a particular era or, or only to the church in Ephesus because what we are hearing here are things that you can find in the Adventist church. Okay? Okay. We Adventists can identify with the church in Ephesus because at times the Adventist church can be like that. In fact, I would argue that most Adventists get carried away in trying to prove right and wrong that they end up forgetting who is the Lord of the church. Who exactly are we here to serve? And that is why, in my view, uh, the futuristic interpretation is correct, that while indeed there was a direct message to the churches of those times, there was also a direct message from Christ to all Christian believers to introspect and see, does this affect me? Have I become more zealous for the church than the Lord of the church? Do I now love the organization more than I love the owner? Um, of the church? Am I now more committed into making sure that I prove whether people are teaching right or wrong to the point that I myself have eclipsed Jesus? Jesus is no longer alive in my sermons, but what is alive is to always prove uh, that uh, others are right and others are wrong in terms of interpretation. And so that is one of the challenges uh, that uh, can be raised. One can see Adventism here. One can see yourself as an individual here. Also, we can see Protestantism here. Remember that the birth of the Protestant movement was about the rejection of the lie, the false teaching. And, and one may argue that indeed, as Protestant churches were so eager to prove the lies that are in Catholicism, down the years later, when you look at uh, Protestant churches, Adventists, Baptists, Methodists, Lutherans, Calvinists, there may be a question that needs to be asked. Is the love of God still there? Is the love of Jesus still there? Or is the obsession 
to be right, now overriding the image um, of Jesus Christ, who is the Lord of the church. Okay? But also, the church in Ephesus had a problem of a group called the Nicolaitans. Now, the Nicolaitans, uh, they were led by a former deacon, okay, found in Acts chapter 6. There was a deacon in the early church called Nicholas, okay? Nicholas ended up becoming a heretic, and he divided the church and quite a number of the early Christians followed him. And so Christ also says, I know, I know that you despise the teachings of the Nicolaitans as much as I do. Now, what did Nicholas do? Why is Nicholas an abomination to Jesus? Why is Jesus saying, I hate uh, what the Nicolaitans are doing? Well, Nicholas is a deacon who came into the church as well when the gospel was spreading. However, Nicholas felt, Nicholas felt that there was nothing about Christianity that should exclude the other pagan practices. Nicholas taught that Christianity is not against some of the practices of the pagan Roman religion. So, those who, of course, saw Christianity as just one among many religions, they liked what Nicholas was saying. So he built up a group of followers that are called the Nicolaitans, a, a, a really an apostate heretic group which wanted to mix Christianity um, with, 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 uh, with, pagan, with pagan law. Okay? And again, if you are going to read this message and only limit it to Ephesus, you would miss that again, when you look at Catholicism and you look at the Anglican church, you will see a bit of this uh, Nicolaitan approach, okay? Where even, even today, you've got many Catholic bishops and many Anglican bishops who sincerely question some of the things that they see in the church, okay? I'm just saying this for all of us Adventists who think every Catholic priest uh, uh, is on board with what they see there. Because sometimes when we teach our Daniel and Revelation, we are so quick to point fingers at Catholics as if all Catholics think the same. No, there are many Catholic bishops and priests around the world who, are, who write theses in their master's degrees and, and dissertations and books, questioning how did these statues make it into the church? Why do we have these statues here? What are they for? Why do we do these crosses? Why do we do this? Why do we do that? Okay? And, and someone may say, because I know Adventists like this reply, yeah, then they must leave and come here. But no, we also have our own problems here and, and we have not left. You know, we, we are complaining from the inside, all right? Uh, we are trying to improve the system while inside. So they are doing the same. So that is the, so you can find some uh, uh, Nicolaitan theology in the Catholic and the Anglican church particularly, where there are a lot of traditions that they are practicing, which really are not rooted in scripture. And they cannot say where they come from, except when you begin to study pagan gods. Then you begin to realize, aha, you know, this practice in the Catholic church started there with this particular uh, a pagan god. So even Catholics who read the message to the church in Ephesus, they'll find a, 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 some of the, a bit of themselves in there. But we are not only going to find, like for example, Catholics or Anglicans in there, you're also going to find Adventists, okay? Just yesterday, um, not, not, was it yesterday? Yesterday was Sunday, okay, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, one loses a bit of track of time in these lockdowns and, and all of these uh, COVID-19 things. I, I was speaking to a group in Namibia and, and I challenged them, for example, and I said, could anyone show me one? No, I'm not even asking for two or three, just one. One verse in the Bible where when God wanted to appoint a leader, he then said, find me a man who returns a faithful tithe. 
Just one verse. And no one could give me that verse. No one. You see, because even in Adventism, you will find some Nicolaitanism. Traditions that are not rooted in, in a biblical position. One is not sure where Adventists got this idea where money must be part of the measurement of good leadership. In the Bible, leaders are recommended purely by the presence of the Holy Spirit, revealed through how they use their spiritual gifts. But for some reason, this church came together and decided when a, when, a, when a man or a woman returns a faithful tithe, it will be a sign that they support God's missions and therefore can be elected as a leader. The devil fund, funds many things which are spiritual. Should we now elect the devil as a church board member because he is good at financing? It's, it's a ridiculous, non-biblical idea. To think that if someone gives you money every month, it means they are devoted. There are drug dealers that donate money to orphanages every month. So what? When has money ever been a standard of measuring righteousness? We also have some Nicolaitan practices in our church. Things that have nothing to do with scripture but purely with the financial interests of those who are in power. Because what ends up happening in our churches, the poor, the poor never get to lead, no matter which gifts God has given to them. Because the measurement in our church is you need to show up financially in the books. Yet nowhere in the Bible has God ever asked a leader to be measured by financial contribution. What the Bible uses is spiritual gifts and family life. Those are the two measurements in the Bible. That when a person shows that the spirit of God is in them, in the gifts that they have been given and how they use them. And when a person demonstrates the love of God first and foremost to their family before they even show it to the outside, then they are fit to be appointed to lead God's church. But here we are, you know, here we are. We are led by multi-adulterous elders simply because they tithe every month faithfully. As long as they appear every month of the 12 months of the year, who cares what they are doing in their private time? Who cares how they are abusing their wives? Who cares whether they are neglecting their fathering duties? No one cares. As long as we get the money, he is the man to lead. For me, those are the challenges that when you read the message of the Church of Ephesus, everyone then needs to find themselves as a church, as individuals, and ask, could this be us? Could this be us? Could we be uh, the people who are more in love with, with the truth versus error that we have forgotten Jesus, the Lord of the church? Could we, could we be, although in this case, the church in Ephesus was opposed to the Nicolaitans, but one may need to ask that question. What about the Nicolaitans could be found in us? The Nicolaitans believed in adopting non-biblical things as part of the Christian worship. And that is why I'm challenging you to, you to think and ask, could there be such things as well among us? Where when you look at these things, I, I could pick up many other things that we do in our church. Study the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. The Bible teaches us about the Sabbath as a holy day. The Sabbath as a holy day. Go from Genesis to Revelation. You are never going to find a single verse in the Bible where a particular program on Sabbath is regarded as holier than others. Yet in the Adventist church, there's a belief that 11 o'clock is holy. 
holier than Sabbath school, holier than uh, afternoon program, holier than Vespa. Even your conduct, you who are here in this group, even your conduct changes towards 11 o'clock. You start singing, tread softly, tread softly. In the morning during summer school, your children were running up and down making noise. But 11 o'clock is coming, tread softly, tread softly. A hypocrisy of not understanding that to God there is no decrees of holiness. If the Sabbath is holy, then everything done on it is holy. These are Nicolaitan practices, which we don't know where they came from, where suddenly in our church, there are degrees of comparisons of holiness on ours, creating a church of divine service commitment. People who will not come during Sabbath school, who will not come during lesson study time, they will only pop in for divine service, get the message and leave. They won't come back for the afternoon program. They won't come back for Vespa. Why? Because we taught them that God arrives between 11 and 12. After that, it's just us and the angels. But the real holiness has left. Read the message of Ephesus begin to introspect it talks to us as individuals families churches denominations and christianity um, as a whole as well the second message it goes to the church in smyrna okay and this now the church in smyrna the city of smyrna was a prosperous city as well However, Smyrna was more a, 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 a respected a, for its libraries as well. It was a city of intellectuals, highly educated individuals um, lived there, okay? There was a lot uh, of, of, of uh, concentration of scholars in Smyrna. It was a, 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 a harbor town, beautiful, um, and uh, 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 it is said that it was even called the, 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 the glorious city uh, of Asia Minor, okay? And when we look at the message that he has there, he says, with your cases, man, I, I know your tribulations, and I also know the poverty uh, that you have gone through speaking to the church there, okay? Now, the two key problems that are arising about the poverty and the tribulations are this. In Smyrna, there was a strong presence of emperor worship. Remember, I spoke about emperor worship when I gave an introduction, uh, 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 and we will see it again when we get to Revelation 13. Secondly, quite a huge number of Jews that had left Israel now lived in Smyrna. So the Christians in Smyrna suffered from both sides. They felt the persecution the most because they were not participating in emperor worship, but they also felt a, a most persecution because of the Jews that were there who were also persecuting them. So Christ says, I understand. I understand the tribulations and the poverty that you are going through. However, do not fear uh, uh, those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. And I mentioned before that this part, uh, uh, um, Revelation 2 verse 10, um, uh, the last part is, is probably one of my uh, favorite uh, pieces of scripture. Thou shalt be faithful till death, and I will give thee the, the crown of eternal life. This verse, in fact, uh, became very well known during the Dark Ages when the Catholic Church was uh, uh, persecuting and killing uh, Protestant reformers and Christians um, around the world. Um, one of the famous stories is, is, is of a, 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 a girl, um, I think it was in, in Germany, if not um, in, in Norway, um, who was going to be killed also because of her faith. And this particular girl had been caught smuggling Bibles, which is a long, long, long story that is very nice to read about when you read um, uh, church history, how Bibles had to be smuggled by the Protestants because the Catholic Church had only licensed the priests 
to have a Bible and no one else. And, and so she was caught. And so they decided they were going to kill her by drowning using the tides, okay, which was very common. Quite a number of the martyrs were killed using uh, the tides. Even in England, they did the same. They would simply put you on a cross at low tide, uh, right into the sea at very low tide. And then as the water rises, it would rise and rise and ultimately bury you under and you would drown and you would die. And so this is one of the, uh, this young woman that they were uh, drowning um, in, in this particular incident, just before the water uh, covered her mouth and she could no longer talk. It's one of the verses that she shouted out that thou shalt be faithful till death and I will give thee the crown of eternal life. And of course, that, that story then spurred throughout um, Europe and, and Asia and really led to the galvanizing of more effort in spreading the gospel regardless um, of the persecutions, all right? So now we are dealing with a message that says Christ understands when we are facing difficulties on both sides. Again, let us look at this message to Smyrna and how it applies to us. You see, the church in Smyrna, as we said, it is facing two critical problems. On one side, it is the Roman Empire. On one side, it is Jews who are supposed to be brothers, but unfortunately, they've got now their own agenda, which makes them to want to oppress Christianity. And here the message Christ is sending to all of us is that I know, I know there are times when you are caught between a rock and a hard place. I know there are times when you suffer so much, it feels as though your faith is useless. Because wherever you turn, you are suffering. It's a message that says, I know that sometimes you face the Romans and the Romans symbolize every system in the world that could oppress you. You could be dealing with financial problems. You could be dealing with physical sickness. You could be dealing with political challenges in the country you are in. You could be dealing with the legalities of your paperwork uh, to work in a foreign country that are just not coming right. These are all the Roman issues these are issues of Caesar. These are issues of the state, the economy. These are issues of the stomach that often cause poverty. As he says, I know the poverty and the tribulations that you are going through. Okay. And, on, and of course, for almost all of us here, it, it is true. You know, when you are suffering in the stomach, it is usually difficult to understand anything intellectual or spiritual. When the stomach is empty, that is why there is so much corruption in the world. It's stomach politics. Whoever can control your stomach will control your thoughts, will control your feelings. You know, when someone puts food on your table, they've also decided which thoughts will come out of your mouth. That is usually the way the world works. And, and so Christ says, I know, I know that for your faith, you have chosen and have accepted to suffer rather than to be controlled in order to prosper. I know that the world is designed against you, that your success is facing many difficulties because you are standing up for your faith and you are refusing to give up. I also know that because of your faith and faithfulness to me, you are facing. Um, some difficulties in terms of poverty and he says you know what you will suffer for about 10 days now the 10 days issue is very important there are those scholars who have traced uh, uh, these 10 days to a 10-year period of, of a persecution of christians in Smyrna to suggest that this could be what Christ was talking about, okay? And indeed, it could be true and related to that period. However, also, there is the idea that says 10 days is a short amount of time. So Christ may have simply meant that your suffering is not going to be long. Now, not just talking to Smyrna, but to all of us, saying your suffering is not going to be long. You will suffer for a season. However, be faithful. Be faithful till death, and I will still give you the crown of eternal life that you deserve. And so it is a message of comfort and hope. 
as we face different troubling situations around the world, as, as particularly as we begin to realize that the world is, is fastly growing into a world that is intolerant of faith. Okay, you see it a lot on social media where there's just this anger and, and desire to ridicule and insult those who are saying, look, I believe in God or I believe in Jesus. And, 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 and there is this idea that is now in the world to somehow belittle or attack that faith. And so Christ says, I am aware that these are the things that will happen, but do not give up. These things will not take away from you your crown, your crown of eternal life, which is reserved for you, for your faithfulness, okay? Then from there, he takes us um, to Pergamos, all right? And when we get to Pergamos, the key to the message, he says, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you all fast to my name, and you did not deny my faith even in the days in which Antipas, was my, uh, who was my faithful uh, martyr, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. All right. Now, this one becomes interesting because, again, we only have a partial uh, 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 indication in the book of Acts of, of an Antipas, an, an apostle that God martyred. Okay, that got muttered, but not much is really known about this particular um, disciple. But there appears to be like Stephen, like Stephen, there appears to have been an apostle called Antipas who was very much faithful and was killed in a very brutal way. Okay, and Christ says, Now I know you, the church in Pergamos that you show the same resilience and commitment to the gospel as Antipas. And I am aware also of the pain uh, that you guys went through when, when, when Antipas uh, was, was muttered. But the interesting part is that Jesus identifies uh, Pergamos as the seat where the Satan, where Satan dwells, where the devil is. But he... He, he is very strong in saying to this church, I, I admonish you for standing firm and resisting him. And then he says to the church, uh, however, I see also that among you, there are those who hold fast to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which I do hate. Okay. And he says to them, repent or else I will come quickly and I will have to deal with you with the sword of my mouth. Okay. So. Although this church is fighting quite a lot to resist evil in it, to the point where it is being martyred, he, he, Christ is also saying, among your own ranks, there are followers um, of, of, of the Nicolaitans. And then it would make sense why he says this church is the place where the seat and the throne of the devil is. Okay? Because but it, it seems to be Pergamos was where the Nicolaitans built their capital. Okay, so as they were being cast out of other churches, they then moved and, and, and settled there and made that their place where, where, where like their headquarters um, of sorts. Okay, and, and they really pushed their agenda from there. And of course, you know, this is not something we are unfamiliar with in the Adventist church. Uh, generally in the Adventist church, almost every 20 years, there will be an eruption of reformers. It's like they come in 20 year cycles. There will be an eruption of reformers, extremists of the highest order. And they will finally build themselves uh, somewhere in every city you'll find them. You'll know a particular church where, you know, reformers have taken over. They are dominating it. You can go to Harare. This is the church that they are in control of. You go to Bulawayo. This is the church they are in control of. Whether you go to uh, Agueru or Chinoi or, you know, wherever, you know, this is where these guys 
uh, have based themselves and this is where they are in control. So the Nicolaitans had based themselves in Pergamos and that is where they were spreading their message of a mixed Christianity, an inclusion of truth and error, a mixing of the worship of Baals and a, 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 a false prophecies into uh, the, 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 the true religion. And so here, what is the key? The message with this church, there is really one key that Christ is sending. Beware of those who will desire to build the throne of Satan among you. Now, interestingly, what do we think he could have meant by the throne of Satan? And, and a, a very direct relationship is when Jesus said to his disciples at one point, you are children of your father, the devil, for he was a liar from the beginning and the truth has never been found in him. Now, do you see the coincidence with the Nicolaitans who specialized in mixing truth with error in order so that, of course, we know once you mix truth with error, it's not the error that becomes more truthful. It's the truth that dies out completely because the truth can never be half truth. It has to be true or not. So here the, uh, uh, Jesus leads us into an understanding that now he is talking about a center of lies, a seat of false teachings and false prophecies, okay? And again, this is why it is going to be important. Please listen to me very carefully. There is a reason, I am not crazy, dear saints. There is a reason why we read the chapters. There is a reason why I email you the books. There is a reason why I refer you to the books. Because the last thing we should ever do as a church is to be in danger of Nicolaitan heresies, where you, you trust the pastor's word without your own due diligence and research. That is why I keep throwing tools your way. Because though I know I teach the truth of scripture, nevertheless, I do not want to ever leave a legacy of people who would quote me, but be unable to quote the word of God and be unable to on their own defend what they have read and have come to understand. Why? Because the devil is out there. He's always looking for influential people he can use to distract the truth of the gospel. And so the best measure of knowing whether our teachers are teaching us the truth is first to prayerfully investigate the spirits that deploy them. And secondly, to read and study for ourselves the things that are being taught in this way we become accountable in making sure that the devil does not build his throne in my heart and in my family. Okay, so reading becomes very important. Studying the word becomes very important. Participating in group sessions like these, where you are not only going to find the word of God, but you're also going to find prayer. Because the strength of this group is that there is quite a lot of prayer here. A prayer before a, 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 a anything starts, just that dedication prayer. Prayer when we start the service. Prayer when we end the service. So there's a lot of praying that takes place here, mixed with a lot of studying of the word as well. So that none of us are in danger of the modern day Nicolaitans who are always recruiting to deceive, but that by knowing the word of God and following the patterns of revelation, we can always, even when we are alone, stand up and testify concerning the faith um, that we have accepted and the faith uh, that we believe in. The last one that we are going to do is Taitira. Okay, and what he says to them uh, is that I know your works, your love, your service, your faith, and your patience. And as for your works, uh, the last are more than the first. Okay, and he says, nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Now, the last message, the corrupt church becomes very, very crucial because it hits something that is quite sensitive, all right? Firstly, 
He says, you are a great church. You are full of love. You are full of patience. You are full of kindness. These are the things that I love. And, and you, are, you, 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 are, you are growing in them. And that's a good thing. And he says, however, the only challenge that I do have with you is that you've allowed Jezebel, that false teacher, to uh, 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 teach among you and in so doing, deceive many um, as well. And he says, that's, that's the problem that I have with you. You've allowed this deceit to take place among you. And, and it is something that I do, I want you to correct. But in particular, now, what does, what does he mean when he says, you have allowed this woman Jezebel um, to be among you, okay? And more importantly, to deceive with sexual immorality, all right? Of course, we know who Jezebel is in the Old Testament. She is the wife of King Ahab. She is a Sidonian, a worshiper of the Baals, who came to Israel to control of the kingdom, to control of the king. She literally ran the show. A wicked woman, really, she... You know, she murdered whom she wanted to murder. She took what she wanted to take. She was that kind of a, 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 a queen and, and a person. And now there is a woman here symbolized to be a Jezebel who is deceiving, okay? And again, it may not necessarily mean one particular woman or one particular prophetess, but it may mean a group, again, that is influential and misleading. But the key part I want to come to here that Jesus is complaining about, and you will see, he doesn't only complain about this with the, uh, uh, the church in Titira, he complains about this as well um, in, 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 in the previous uh, 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 churches. I think it is in Pergamos, if not Smyrna, where he complains about food dedicated to idols. He says, this woman, is teaching you guys to eat food dedicated to idols. Now I'm going to come to something very significant here. Please follow very carefully. This is where Jesus seems to be correcting a position that Paul had. Remember there was a debate between Paul and Peter about food dedicated to idols. Peter believed food dedicated to idols should not be eaten at all, and it shouldn't be touched. And Paul says, I don't see a problem. We know idols don't exist. We know that. So if people are going to be stupidly giving food to a piece of wood, which we know is nothing but wood, Take that food and eat it. You know, people are just wasting food, giving it to idols. And Christ here seems to say, actually, I do not want my people to be participating in food dedicated to idols. Now, what is Jesus talking about here? It is merely a bigger symbolism than just the issue of food. Okay? What Christ is addressing here is... Do not bring into my church anything of ill gain, anything of deceitful profiteering. I do not want in my church. Do not bring into the church anything that has been gained by immoral practice. I don't want it here. I don't want you eating anything that is a benefit of idolatrous living. I don't want you associating with any gifts given under the umbrella of wickedness. You as my children should walk away from such. Okay? And um, here, Jesus is not saying the church must perform a forensic investigation of where your tithes are coming from, where your money is coming from. No, no. What is merely saying to them is that when I have shown you the source, I do not expect you to take things from a source that is ungodly. He is not saying now go around asking people, show us your pay slip, 
hey, where do you work? Oh, you, you, you work for a tobacco company. We don't want your tithe. No. The church is not a forensic auditor, but what he is saying is whenever the church becomes aware, whenever the church becomes aware that there are problems, it should not be afraid. And that is why I have stood my ground even on the issue of Zimbabwe, and I've made it clear, and I still make it clear, there are prominent Adventists that are deeply corrupt, involved with the ZANU-PF and the president of the country and the former president. Adventists who have used their names to channel funds out and in of Zimbabwe on behalf of corrupt politicians who are under sanctions. And the church has received the glorious funding from those people and has turned a blind eye, even though courts and the media and investigators have warned repeatedly saying, our politicians are being assisted by these individuals. And what do those individuals do? They buy a a Mercedes Benz here and a Mercedes Benz there for a conference president and a union president and now the church in Zimbabwe is silent. All churches in Zimbabwe have condemned what is happening except for the Adventist church. Busy saying no it's not our duty to be in politics. Liars, their stomachs are full from ill gain. Their stomachs are full from food dedicated to idols. That is why they will not speak. Even the Catholics, whom we think we are better than them, they have taken a stand on the Zimbabwean issue and have made it clear that they do not support under any circumstances what is happening there. You know what our church does? Our church hides behind the second coming of Jesus whenever it is to tell the truth. No, brethren, our duty is to only preach the second coming. When they say that, you must know their stomachs are full. They know exactly that when they speak out, they compromise their income. And for me, that is one of the most critical things. When the church fails to stand up for the truth, so that we may keep making money, we have eaten food dedicated to idols. We have betrayed the gospel in order to fill our stomachs. And that message is not only about Zimbabwe, even here, even here, there are many prominent Adventists here in South Africa who suddenly do not, who used to be our friends until we spoke the truth to power. Now they don't want to speak to us. Because when, when I preach and I condemn Christians who surround the ANC, who do not speak the truth to power, suddenly, even here, our own Adventist brethren start WhatsApping you privately under the message, saying, no, pastor, there, there are diplomatic ways of saying this. They are eating from the same corruption, fruits of idolatry. And you know what these guys are? They are very good at rushing to take care of the personal needs of the influential pastors so that they quickly buy the mouth of the church and the church is silent. Suddenly, you even receive an email from the union reprimanding you. You are preaching politics in the pulpit because you are disturbing their cash flow. The reality that many Adventists don't want to admit is that we are a remnant church as far as God's people are concerned. But as an organization, we are corrupt like any other organization on earth. Money speaks more than the Holy Spirit. Fruits of idolatry move in between bank accounts in this church and no one wants to speak because we are hiding behind remnancy while fruits of idolatry are sealing the mouths of our presidents in conferences, in unions and divisions, the mouths of our directors, our local pastors, our district pastors, our everywhere. We are entertaining fruits of idolatry.
And Jesus says, do not. Do not eat food dedicated to idols. And again, here Jesus is not saying go around investigating people. But where Jesus is clear is that when you can see, when you can see the devil at work, you can't turn a blind eye. You are my people. You are my people. And you are my church. You don't need to eat food dedicated to idols to fill your stomachs. I am the God who gave you manna in the wilderness. You have every right to reject the food dedicated to idols. You won't die. I will give you manna from heaven and they will see that I can sustain the church without any corrupt influence in it. But also the message must be applied at our personal level. Are we eating fruits of idolatry in our personal lives? What about your friendships? Friendships based on gossip. Huh? Fruits of idolatry. What connects you as friends is that you keep devouring people's names. So you are idols feeding each other food dedicated to idols. The cornerstone of your friendship is to always be bad-mouthing other people. We all must introspect on these messages. They are not just about the church at a large scale of Christianity, but they also speak to me as an individual. Where am I Ephesus? Where am I Smyrna? Where am I Pegamos? Where am I Tytira? And what is Christ warning me about? That if I don't address, he says he will remove his lampstand from me. But if I do address, then he will give me the blessings that are according. May God bless you and may God keep you as we continue. So tomorrow we are dealing with chapter 3 and then on Wednesday, which is our last uh, day this, uh, to meet this week, then we are going to be doing um, chapter 4. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you once again this evening for your leadership and teaching. And Holy Spirit, we plead. As we read these messages, what concerns me the most is they should mean something to me in my personal life. Sometimes when we study the book of Revelation, we only study it to understand big national and international events. And we forget that these things also have interpretation and application in our personal lives. And that the greatest victory of them all is if we can overcome what we are facing at a personal level. So, Father, I pray, implement, entrench these messages in our personal lives, cause us to reflect and to return back to you where we are not doing right. And where we are doing right, let us send all the glory and honor to you. For we pray and ask all this through Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior.